Hello everyone, my name is Kyle Kingsbury. Welcome to Jepson and SciLaDB. You might know me as AFER from the internet, and my job is to break databases. I look for safety violations in distributed systems. And the way I do this is using a tool called Jepson. Scylla has a Jepson test suite already, and they asked me to come along and evaluate its safety against recent builds of SciLaDB. Jepson's approach is to run a bunch of clients externally to the system. So we have several JVM processes, which use the standard Scylla Java client to make requests of a SciLaDB cluster running on five nodes. Those nodes are connected via a normal IP network. So we're looking at the actual behavior of Scylla binaries as opposed to doing some sort of abstract model. Now we have no visibility into the SciLaDB itself. All of our testing is performed purely from the view of clients. And to do that, we generate randomized operations like write the number five to the key X. We then send that operation to SciLaDB and we record the response. Those responses can be of few main types. We could have an okay operation where we know it took place. It could fail and we know it did not take place or some other outcome could occur. We could have a timeout or maybe some sort of unknown exception. And in those cases, we'll assume that the operation may or may not have happened or might even happen later. We leave the invocation open for all time. What this gives us is a concurrent history, a tapestry of different clients performing operations over time. And then we can start to ask questions about that history. For instance, to verify linearizability, the property that every operation appears to take place atomically in some total order consistent with the real-time order, we could try to find a path that moves forward in time and touches every OK operation, and maybe some of the crashed ones. If along that path, the data type makes sense, you always read prior writes, then we know the history is linearizable. If we're looking for a serializability violation, we could build a dependency graph between operations and then look for cycles in that graph. And that's one of the key tools we use against SciLaDB. So our general pattern of attack here is to generate randomized operations, to apply them to the system using network clients, and to record an abstract history of those operations. Then we verify that history is consistent with some model of the system, that it obeys some laws. While this is going on, we're going to introduce faults. We'll create network partitions, we will change clocks, we kill processes and pause processes, and we also perform membership transitions, like adding, removing, and decommissioning nodes. This research applies to Scylla to be 4.2 RC3 and subsequent development builds. This started in summer of 2020 and concluded in fall of 2020. So things may have changed since this recording. If you're familiar with SciLaDB, you know its pitch is essentially Cassandra, but faster. The Cassandra API, the Cassandra data structures, all the things you know and love about Cassandra, except with lower latency and hopefully higher throughput. Like Cassandra, it's a wide column store, which means its rows may have arbitrarily many cells, and it offers eventually consistent, totally available defaults. You can also upgrade to optional Paxos-based transactions for additional safety. Now, the default way of operating in Cassandra and SciLaDB is called last right wins. What happens in last right wins is that when you modify a cell or you have two different values of a cell, whether from the client or another server, you always pick the cell with the highest timestamp. And timestamps here are assigned arbitrarily, typically by the wall clock on the clients. So if I have two states of a dog, one sleepy, one playful, sleepy wins because it has a higher timestamp. This can lead to lost updates. For example, if two clients can currently read zero, one adds one and the other adds two, uh, and then they write those values back, no matter what their timestamps are, the fact that the updates are concurrent means that one of the updates will be deleted in favor of the other. In this case, zero plus one plus two is actually equal to one. You have a lost update. However, you don't always have to have lost updates. CQL collections offer data types like maps, sets, and lists. And some subsets of operations on those, op on those data types actually do commute. In those cases, we can avoid lost updates by using the CQL collection API. So let's try it out. The Jepson tests included uh, a series of transactions which looked like this. We create a table for sets, and we put a single row into it using insert. We give it the empty set as its initial value. Then we update the set. We change that row, and we add a single unique element to it. We do this a bunch of times, different transactions. But for now, let's just think about one. If we've added one to the empty set, you would expect that a resulting value be one. But some of the time, it's actually the empty set, which is a little bit surprising. This even happens if you execute the update strictly after the insert completes. And it also happens with consistency level all, the strongest level for the classic Cassandra and Scylla consistency model. 
what happens here is that we perform an insert on the point client and that insert for the empty set gets a timestamp which is higher than a later update, perhaps because the clocks are skewed. When the update goes through, it is ignored in favor of the original insert. So we end up with a result that has nothing in it. However, this is completely invisible to the clients. They both see that the operation completed okay. Likewise, if the update takes place first on the server, it will still be overwritten by a later insert with a higher timestamp. Again, nobody knows this is happening. There are three things that make this surprising. One of them is that SiloDB is, of course, not linearizable. You can't rely on the real-time order of events to tell you anything about the actual order that they're executed in. The second factor is that inserts and updates are essentially equivalent. This is a little bit counterintuitive if you come from something like SQL, where insert and update have very different semantics. Finally, if you're used to other eventually consistent data types, like observed removed sets, you might expect that inserting an empty set and adding something to the set would commute, giving you a set with the insert present. This is not the case in, in Scylla. Scylla CQL data types uh, for sets and maps actually create a deletion tombstone, which destroys all writes with, with previous timestamps. Now, this is nothing new. It is known that Scylla and Cassandra do this because it's been how they work for years. Uh, but the documentation for basic DML operations in Cassandra and Scylla actually showed this pattern, insert a row and then update it. They didn't clarify that that was perhaps unsafe. This bug uh, in the test suite slipped by the Cassandra engineer who worked on it, the Scylla engineer who ported it to SciLaDB, it slipped by me when I reviewed it, and then additional Scylla engineers, until finally a Scylla engineer caught that we were performing an insert of an empty set at the start of the test. I did an informal survey to get a gut check on this, and out of 11 CQL users, not one person correctly predicted this outcome. My favorite response from that survey was simply, I feel bad. Now, the Scylla documentation offers clear examples of how to do this stuff correctly and what to watch out for, which I think will help users make uh, better decisions around writing their, their update and inserts. If you want to avoid this kind of problem, you can use lightweight transactions, and this uses Paxos to ensure that transactions are linearizable. Now, if you're familiar with Paxos, you know that it typically takes two network hops, one round trip at minimum. And that minimum is practically achievable in pretty much every Paxos or consensus-based system out there, Zookeeper, Raft, Console, Etcd, React, and so on. However, in Cassandra, it takes four round trips. They've implemented a, a more general, less optimized form of Paxos. Scylla has optimized some. They're down to three round trips, but do be aware that the cost might be higher than other data systems. You can also only express limited types of transactions in LWT. It's not a general purpose transaction system where you could give it arbitrary functions or sessions. Instead, you can only perform single inserts, updates, deletes, each one of which must have a conditional clause attached. Or you could perform a single select query across a set of pre-specified keys. However, you cannot select a CQL collection as a part of that multi-select. Or you can begin a batch operation where you perform multiple inserts, updates, and deletes combined. All of these operations must take place in the scope of a single partition because that's where the Paxos state machine lives. Now we found a bug with lightweight transactions and that involved aborted reads. If you had a process crash and a network partition concurrently, you could append a number to a list, say 52, and get what's called an unavailable exception, not enough replicas available for query. You might assume this meant that the operation did not take place. It does suggest that this is a definite failure and the docs seem to confirm that. However, a select query could later show the consequences of that failed write. So in Scylla 4.3.rc1, they give a write timeout in section instead, which suggests to the user properly that this could have been a result that succeeded or could have failed. Lightweight transactions could also have weird consequences with batch updates. If you perform a batch where you insert, say, or you update, say, two keys, one and two, you might expect to get back rows showing the results for keys one and two. But sometimes you get back the results for keys two and one, which makes it a little tricky to figure out which update statement resulted in what row. Uh, you could also just get back a uh, key null or key one, and this is definitely a bug. You should have had either one null or one two, but never just key one. Scylla sometimes stripped out null values from the results sets of batch transactions. Scylla 4.3 RC1 addresses this by ensuring that the results of a batch transaction occur in statement order. 7170 was an issue with non-lightweight transaction isolation. So doing normal operations, no transactions, the Scylla documentation still says that inserts, updates, deletes, and batch operations are, quote, isolated and atomic. 
Now, if you're thinking about isolation in a database context, you're probably thinking about serializability, which is the property that every transaction appears to take place in some total order. But obviously, this cannot be the case for Scylla CQL data types. For instance, if I have two replicas of the same key in Scylla on nodes S1 and S2, and on one I add two, and on the other I add one, I could get back successful responses and be able to read the set just one and the set just two. These two sets cannot possibly have occurred in some total order. You should see either one, then one, two, or two, then one, two. But this isn't just a problem with CQL updates. It also applies to plain old writes, even to a single row. If you do two writes to two, or a single write to two different cells in a row, or you perform a batch which updates multiple rows, you can see isolation violations. To demonstrate this, we did a test where we inserted plus or minus some number, and we chose a unique number for each update. And we always updated two keys, x and y. What this means is that you should always see x plus 7, y minus 7, or plus 8, plus 8, minus 2, minus 2. But some of the time, you get a mixed result, like plus 7, minus 3. These two values came from different transactions, which is an isolation violation. This occurs even with consistency level all, the default atomic monotonic timestamp generator, without any faults in healthy clusters and with perfectly synchronized clocks. At 500 reads and 500 writes per second, we saw isolation violations roughly every 20 seconds in our testing, and that rate would increase when timestamps were quantized. This occurs because Scylla resolves uh, changes to cells on a per cell rather than a per operation basis. So if one client writes x1, y minus 1, and another client writes x minus 2, y2, and they happen to choose the same timestamp, then Scylla resolves the first cell x by looking at the timestamps, seeing they're equal, and picking 1 because it's the bigger value. It does the same thing for y, which results in y2, and we obtained a mixed result. So this isn't news. Jepson found this issue in 2013 at Cassandra. Cassandra's own engineers reported it again as a consequence of read repair in 2014. Scylla reported it in 2017, and there's still open issues at Cassandra today to add proper row-level isolation. And yet, the Cassandra docs continue to say Rights are performed with full row-level isolation, and Scylla inherited those documentation claims. Now, the Scylla documentation no longer claims isolation and instead offers examples of what can happen when timestamps conflict, which I think will help guide users to make better decisions around rights. In particular, you want to be aware that you can't modify two fields in a row atomically, uh, or in a, you know, atomic in the isolation sense. You can't, for example, write a password hash and a salt field at the same time, they might get mixed together with other transactions. You wind up with a password hash from one and the salt from another. With lightweight transactions, you could also see stale reads. We'd perform a write of six, a write of seven, 40 seconds of reads and writes, all of which looked fine, and then suddenly the value would flip back to six again. This happened even in healthy clusters without faults and with single reads and write transactions. In fact, out of 1172 transactions in a two-minute test, we saw 264 of them involved in a single massive real-time isolation violation. And this isn't so bad. It's just stale read, right? We're seeing an old version of the data, but it's not a version that never happened. Except that then we started seeing split brain. Uh, for example, here we have a single list X, and we're appending unique integers to it. We get 17, 18, 19, 17, 18, 19, 20. Every new append should result in something new at the end of the list. Except that sometimes a prefix of the list would disappear and then it would come back again. Or we would have a postfix of the list flip back and forth between two completely different histories. Here we have 261 and 212 on two different nodes. Later on, they might get merged together. This happened again in healthy clusters with serial reads, lightweight transaction writes, doing everything as safely as possible, still went in the split brain. This is due to an improper hash calculation. When Scylla tries to figure out if it has to, um, when it has two copies of the same row, which are different, it hashes them. And that hash calculation would stop looking at the row once it hit a cell which was null. So here, key three is null. And because the two rows are equivalent up to key three, they consider themselves to be identical as far as the hash calculation is concerned. This does mean there's also a small chance of isolation violations when you happen to have hash collisions, which I'm a little concerned about, but hopefully it's not a huge deal in practice. Now this has been fixed in 4.2. Now the hash calculation proceeds over the entire row. We also found several issues with membership changes. In particular, when we removed or decommissioned nodes, uh, we could end up in situations with split brain, like 
one history shows 3, 3, 9, 10, and another node shows 15, 16, 17, 15, 16, 17, 24, two completely different copies of the same record. We could also see temporal anomalies, like here we append 9, 10, and another appends 11, 12, 13. We should observe those appends in total order, but we don't. The node on the right shows 11, 12, 13 without 9, 10, and the node on the left does see 9, 10. So something really strange is going on. There are three problems with contributing to this fault. One of them is that during the repair streaming process, ScillyDB nodes could stream data from only a single other replica as opposed to a majority of replicas. That meant they could miss out on writes that were occurring on the majority. That was fixed in 829's B4C1. But we also had problems with list operations and the way they chose the keys for CQL collections. Uh, in a list, each element in the list is stored in a separate Scylla cell, and those cell IDs are chosen based on the local coordinator timestamp as opposed to the lightweight transaction timestamp. That could lead to collisions and reorderings and weird things. Uh, this is also a little tricky when you have multiple appends because the lightweight transaction timestamp uh, might collide with previous multiple operations. So this is work in progress. I think there's code to fix it now, but the issue is still open. The final problem we had is that Septon's testing performed membership changes concurrently. So we might, for example, start to add a node while a previous node was still being removed. And that, according to SillaDB, is illegal. An operator must ensure that every previous membership operation is completed before starting a new one. I don't know how to do this. There's no way to figure out when a membership operation is actually done. You can ask a single node, but its node tool status might lie to you about the actual state of the cluster because there could be other nodes where the operation hasn't completed yet. So as far as I can tell, you actually have to have every node alive and get unanimous agreement before proceeding to another membership operation, which could be tricky when you're trying to, say, add or remove nodes during some sort of fault scenario. The second problem we had is that when we removed nodes, we would follow the documentation. We'd check if the status uh, of the node was read to be down. And indeed, some node here shows that node C is down. And then we'd ask node A to please remove node C. And it would say, great, I'll do it. However, C in this case isn't actually dead. It's just inaccessible to A, maybe because it uh, had an IO stall or it's partitioned or paused or something's gone wrong. As a result, you can get into split brain. And Scylla says this scenario is also illegal. Users must not issue a remove node command unless they have manually confirmed that the node is no longer running. That means you have to kill the VM or physically unplug the machine or log in and shut it down. Uh, you, can't, you can't move on unless you've guaranteed the node is actually dead. Can't reach it, can't remove it. This is, of course, um, a surprise to me uh, <laughs> because many databases do allow you to remove nodes which are temporarily partitioned. Uh, and the documentation didn't tell you you couldn't do this. As far as I know, there was actually no documentation of this requirement. So one of the things I want to encourage Scylla to do, and which I believe they're working on right now, is to add improved documentation to explain these rules to users. As of December 11th, 2020, we found seven problems in Scylla to be, depending on how you count. Five of those have been patched or documented, and two of them are pending. One almost done, the other one will take a while. What's left to change is that membership changes uh, in conjunction with other types of failures like network partitions can result in split brain. This partially can be addressed by documentation. Uh, users should be informed that they can't, for example, issue remove node commands unless they've guaranteed the node is actually dead. And they have to make sure that every node is completed in membership operation before they move on to another one. But in the long run, these operations shouldn't be illegal in the first place. Other cluster systems can and do allow you to make changes concurrently and figure it out. Um, this is because Cassandra's gossip system formed the core of Scylla's membership protocol as well. And that membership protocol is not totally ordered. It's not a consensus system. So once Scylla implements RAP for their membership, they should be able to enforce this order themselves. Finally, remember that timestamps in Scylla are tricky. If you need order or isolation between transactions, use lightweight transactions. I want to thank SillaDB, who funded this research, Camille, Peter, Pyotr, Dor, Duarte, Constantine, Alejo, and Pavel from the Scylla team all helped out with this research. Thank you all very much for watching. And if you want to read more about this, there'll be a full report on jepson.io. Thanks for your time.